I'm Janet Morana, Executive Director of Priest for Life. Welcome to Just Ask Janet. And of course, I'm still holding that nine o'clock slot for Father Pavone. As you know, he's recuperating from his open heart surgery. He's doing fantastic. He'll be back with us pretty soon. And then, of course, I'll move to my little bit earlier slot. Well, joining me today is one of my favorite pro-life leaders. Um, he has known Father Pavone and I for decades. Uh, he, they've done so much work, and we're going to be talking about that uh, in advancing to bringing the end to abortion. But also, too, they're great friends of mine and Father Pavone, his whole ministry, because they actually assisted us in getting our whole TV groove going because we would go to their studio to produce our Gospel of Life program that was featured for a while there on Sky Angel. So Father Pavone and I are so grateful and and our and love the friendship we have with my dear friend Mark Crutcher. Mark, welcome to the program. Well, thank you, Janet. It is my pleasure to be with you. Well, you know, life dynamics. I can remember when Father Pavone was my parish priest. We were hanging on everything that you were coming out with when we were learning about the pro-life movement. Um, there was you had a, a thing called Firestorm at the time, and we mm -hmm. read it page by page, everything. Uh, and then, of course, I think the the big the biggest thing you came out with was Line Five, which I'm going to ask you to tell everyone about. But then, some of the things that the pro-life movement is seeing as if it's new now, you've been doing that for a long time. This investigative reporting, behind the scenes exposed in the industry. So give everyone who's not familiar with the fantastic work of Life Dynamics, give us a little snapshot of kind of like back in the 90s to now. Well, as you know, we started out, uh, my idea was that uh, when we start a new pro-life organization, I don't want it to be doing the things that other groups are doing. If they're doing it, let them do it. But one of the holes that I saw in the pro-life effort was um, intelligence gathering. And you can't win wars, and this is a war, without intelligence gathering. And so we uh, dedicated ourselves to do that. We started going undercover inside the abortion industry. And, and of course, this is just one of many things that, that we're doing, but you alluded to it. And we were the group that eventually came out with the um, revelations about them selling the body parts uh, of babies that they kill in abortions. And of course, David Daleiden came along later on and, and redid it uh, and used video. We were using mostly audio uh, equipment at that time. And, uh, but we proved that they were marketing the, the dead bodies of the babies they killed and they were making money off of them. Um, and that's still going on, by the way. Um, we also were the group that revealed the um, uh, pedophile protection racket that Planned Parenthood and the National Abortion Federation clinics are, are perpetuating, and that's still going on. We proved that, that these guys are harboring men who sexually abuse uh, minor girls. And again, that's, that's still happening today. Um, we're also the group that produced MAFA 21, because my idea was we need to make sure the, the black community knows that the real reason for the legalization of abortion was to get rid of them. And uh, so we produced my offer 21 in 2009, and it is still going gangbusters. We thought that project would be over in 18 months or, or two years at the most, and it's still going gangbusters right now. Um, so, Mark, let's focus on just for a minute on the Alpha 21 for a moment. Uh, okay. Because as you know, Alveda King, who's our pastoral associate of Priest for Life, I know she uh, she promotes it like crazy. Uh, and the awareness that when the when people in the black communities watch Ma'afa 21, they, they, their mouths are like open, like what? Right. What? I mean, they can't. So give the audience a little bit idea of what does Ma'afa 21 do? Well, what we did is I had always known and, and anybody that's been around this movement for, for any length of time um, know that the original reason for the legalization of abortion had nothing to do with women's rights or reproductive freedom or choice or any of this other nonsense you hear from the other side. It was it was a function of eugenics and they were trying to get rid of uh, minority communities. And what we did is we started looking for evidence of this that we that we could lay our hands on, starting with today and working backwards. And we discovered a lot of interesting things. One of them was that if you go back into the 60s, when we, when we got back to that level, um, the first pro-life groups in this country were not uh, 
any pro-life organization that we're aware of today, mine or yours or anyone, any other one. And it was not the Republican party for sure. The original anti-abortion groups in America were the civil rights groups of the sixties because they recognized that abortion was being touted as a way to get rid of minority neighborhoods and not minority communities. And so you had people like the Nation of Islam and the Black Panthers and uh, even Elijah Muhammad wrote a book um, about this in two chapters in that book. He talks about abortion and birth control being used to get rid of the black community. And as we kept on going back in time, we go from the 60s and then we get into 50s, what we discovered was that where it starts, where the, uh, where the uh, abortion holocaust starts, is at the end of slavery. And that uh, it sounds strange to say so, but if you watch my Alpha 21, you see how we connect the dots from the, from the days when slavery was starting to end until today. And it's, a non, it's an unbroken stream between the two. And what happened at the end of slavery was that these people, these eugenics uh, crowd that had made millions and millions off the backs of slaves uh, were concerned that when slavery ended, you're going to have 4 million black people in this country who were, who we've kept artificially uh, unable to be employed anywhere but the cotton fields. And that's going to financially devastate the country. So they had started looking for ways to get rid of them. Uh, and they went through several different uh, strategies, starting with uh, the, the idea of sending them back to Africa. Um, the, that was there was a logistics nightmare. You can't put four million people on ships and send them back to Africa, especially four million people, almost all of whom had never been to Africa in their life. They were born here by this point. Um, so they went through several different strategies to to get rid of the black population, um, negative eugenics, positive eugenics, um, and sterilization. They kept on trying different different ideas to to um, accomplish this and eventually they landed on abortion and right now uh, and they've and they've pushed abortion in the black community they've advertised more there they they have put their facilities disproportionately in black communities today a black woman is about five times as likely to kill her baby in the womb as is a white woman and this is having a dramatic effect on the black population. You know, we hear a lot of talk, Janet, about um, voter suppression and how that's being something that's perpetrated by the by the Republicans or by the Trump people or whoever. There is no greater example of voter suppression than abortion. It has dramatically reduced the the political power of the black community in America. And well, so, you know, Mark, um, even in New York City, where I used to be from, uh, there's more black babies are aborted than are born in right. New York, right. which and is like an abortion capital. You know, so we all know, I think Mahafa uh, 21 is one of the, the finest uh, things. And brothers and sisters, if you haven't seen Mahafa 21, Mark, tell them how they can get a copy. Well, they can get a copy from us or they can go to mahafa 21com M-A-A-F-A 21.com. Um, and either they can order a DVD if they like. Um, or they can watch it for free on uh, YouTube or they can watch it for free at myalpha21.com. So we're not trying to, you know, we're not trying to get rich off this deal. We're, <laughs> we'll, we'll let you watch it for nothing. But right. um, it's, um, it has totally turned things around in the black community. What we have seen since 2009 has been nothing short of, of uh, astonishing in the way we're now able to, to bring African-American people into the pro-life movement. And right. that, that's going to continue because the more people that see Maafa and the more uh, attention that it gets in the black community, the more people are going to wake up and see uh, that they've been lied to and deceived. Right. Well, then, you know, when you, you alluded already about the baby body parts, tell everyone what year did you break that whole story? And I remember seeing you even guys had, had gotten undercover price lists, right, of how much they would pay for all the body parts. What year was that when you first broke that story, well, Mark? Well, we started on that project in uh, about 1996, but we were undercover uh, in several abortion clinics, but the primary one was a um, Planned Parenthood facility in Overland Park, Kansas. 
we were undercover there for 31 months doing uh, research and investigations. And yeah, you're right. We were able to get, I mean, they were selling, literally, I know this sounds bizarre. They're selling baby parts the way General Motors sells car parts. Right. And they have lists how much they were willing to pay or how much they're willing to sell stuff for. Um, we even had uh, the, the primary company that was doing that at the time was a company called Opening Lines. And they kept parts in stock. They would bring them in and keep them frozen. And they would send a list to their buyers saying, this is the, these are the materials we have right now, but if you need something different, let us know and we'll, we'll uh, acquire those uh, tissues or body parts. And then Dave, Dave, David Delight, and then I know, came to you when he had the idea of trying to, to do this project, like a new version of it. Right. Uh, and you kind of mentored him, didn't you? Oh yeah, we met with him quite a few times. Um, and, uh, you know, he did astonishing work. I mean, uh, the stuff that he did was was amazing. Uh, I think, and I, and I really don't want to get into it here, but he made some mistakes that um, had, I warned him about that are coming back to haunt him now. Um, but he did really fantastic work and basically confirmed everything that we had been saying um, since 2000. Oh. Right. And then, so Mark, I know recently you, Father Frank and I had a, a discussion uh, about what does the pro-life me movement need to do now? Um, how are we going to be moving the ball and winning? And we discussed that it, it's time to uh, energize, right, the grassroots. Tell us about some of your ideas about that. Well, you know, you and I and Father Frank have talked for the last three or four years now about the problem that we're seeing with um, kind of the fire in the belly going out of the pro-life movement. Um, you know, I've been at this almost 40 years. And when I first got into it, uh, there was a lot of excitement and, and there was a lot of, like I said, fire in the belly and people, oh, we're going to win this and we're going to do this and we're going to do that. Um, and over the years, that has kind of gone away. And there's, there's not a lot of fire in the belly right now. Um, so that's a problem that it, as leaders in the pro-life movement, it's our responsibility to deal with that. And if we can't, then we need to get out and move on to something else. But um, we've also got a problem. And, and again, it's, it's one of somewhat of our own making, which is a lot of these younger pro-lifers that are coming in here. We, and we hear all these statistics and we see these studies showing pro-life people are more pro-life than ever and, and than they've ever been. I mean, young people are more pro-life than they've ever been. Um, but what does that mean? because I have been in environments where I've taken questions from some of these kids that are good, intelligent kids, but what they don't know, they don't even know what they don't know. And some of them are what I call low information pro-lifers. And that makes them very easy to pick off. And the other side has picked up on this and they're going after these low information pro-lifers. And uh, I see even among younger pro-life leaders, people that run national organizations that are, uh, you know, a generation or so behind me and you, um, I hear them making statements all the time, which indicate to me they don't understand the fundamental pro-life position. They don't, they don't grasp it and they don't know how to apply it to other areas. And mm -hmm. we've got to solve that problem, Janet. We, 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 you know, when you come into something like this and you, as you age and I have certainly aged in this deal. Um, I can remember early in the, in my career when I'd go to leader, leadership meetings, the old Fieldstead meetings and stuff like that, I'd come home and tell my wife that it's kind of weird being the youngest person in the room. Now I can go to one of them and be the oldest person in the room. So I have definitely aged. But we all know that if we don't win, we have to prepare the next generation to ha so we can hand the baton off to them. I am extremely concerned, and I've talked to other leaders, and not just you and Father Frank, but I've talked to several other national leaders about this, and they all have the same exact opinion. We're not prepared right now to hand off the baton because they're not prepared to receive it. And we've got to <clears throat> fix that situation. That's our responsibility to fix. And Mark, wouldn't you consider part of the problem here, like, you know, they like to call us pro-lifers, but... Pro-life, that's such a broad term. I mean, really what we are is we're anti-abortion, right. right? We're against the killing of unborn children in the womb. And don't you think 
in order to prepare the younger people uh, and, and hand a baton to somebody, we've got to get change the language, don't you think, and the dynamic of, of how we're speaking about what we're doing. No. Right. Well, not only that, we, I'm going to take it a step further. You say we're not pro-life, we're anti-abortion. I want to step, take it a step forward. I think we need to stop, start getting away from, we should have never gotten dragged into the abortion battle to begin with. Your position and mine has nothing to do with abortion. It has to do with protecting the unborn child. And mm -hmm. for example, we should be able to, we should be going to our, when we have a politician that jumps up here and is running for Congress or Senate or whatever, we have a tendency to go in there and ask them what their position on abortion is. What we should be saying to them is, we don't care what your position on abortion is. We don't think, care what you think about it, what you feel about it, what you believe about abortion. That's irrelevant to us. What we want to know is what's your position on the unborn child? Is the unborn child a living human being entitled to have his or her life protected by law? That's all we need to know. Right. Abortion takes care of itself if we do that. But when we put the focus on abortion, what we have then, and, and you and I have seen this before, you have some moral defective, like say um, Hillary Clinton running for president. And she goes on national television and when they ask her about abortion, what's your views on abortion? She says, well, I'm very troubled by abortion. I don't like abortion. I don't think anybody likes abortion, but I support a woman's right to choose. And you will actually have, when she says, I don't support abortion, I'm not in favor of abortion, I don't like abortion, you'll actually have people sucked into that and say, you know what, Hillary Clinton is, is basically pro-life. She's not. Yeah. And no. what, if we ask her a very simple question, uh, hey, Hillary, we don't care what you think about abortion. Is the unborn child a living human being entitled to have his or her life protected by law? Now she can't weasel. She has to answer that one way or the other. She cannot weasel out of it. And we've got to go back to that. When I first got in this, that was the primary issue that we all addressed, we all dealt with. And I'm a big believer, as we, you and I and Father Frank talked to the, the other day, that um, we've got to go back to our roots. We've got to reestablish the pro-life principle so that all these young people that are coming into the movement now understand what it is and understand how to articulate it. Right. Well, you know, Mark, um, you guys have so many great resources. And what I did was I pulled uh, just now, I want to show everybody um, one of the, to me, one of the most brilliant commercials you've done. Um, so the, I call, I nickname it uh, the, the beads commercial, but I think you call it millions dead. So brothers and sisters, just so you can understand how many unborn babies are, have been murdered by abortion. Let's take a look at this brilliant commercial that was done by Mark and Life Dynamics.
I mean, Mark, I, I just think that's such a dramatic way of showing uh, the children that are dying every day. And, you know, uh, the number you used is 3,000 a day. And I know how some people say, well, you know, it might be coming down to 3,000. I say, no, 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 no. It's 3,000 or someone that wants to use a different number right now, 2,500 a day. That's only the ones that we can count, which means states like California and New York, they don't report. And what about all the chemical abortion now? Uh, who's keeping track of that, right? So right. when you think about it, Mark, it's even worse than what we're claiming it is right now, don't, wouldn't you say? Probably so. And But the point is, what if it was just 10 babies? Right. We, st we still have to fight for those 10 babies. And the reason we did this video is because when you start telling people, and by the way, this was done several years ago, so it would be much worse now than it was then. You'd have to have another jar full of beads. Right. Um, and, and if anybody thinks that's not accurate, we counted... We did the proportions on that, and it is totally accurate, uh, the ratio there. Um, but, you know, the average person can't identify with 60 million dead babies. They just, they can't process that in their mind. And it's a little bit like uh, one of the things that's helping the Biden administration right now, if you want to call it an administration, um, with their $6 trillion budget proposals, is that the they know good and well the average american cannot fathom a trillion dollars and how much money that is that they, they just can't think in those terms um so they get away with it because of that uh and they don't realize that a, that a tr they don't think about the fact that a trillion dollars is a thousand billion and a billion dollars is a thousand million and so on down the line and it, the numbers just get so astronomical that nobody can can process them. And that was what we were trying to show in this in a in a physical way. Uh, if you you know, this little jar right here is all the soldiers killed in every war we've ever fought. And then we have these eight or nine jars, whatever it was, 10 or 11 jars, whatever it was. And these are all the babies we killed in the war on the unborn. Um, so that's what we were trying to accomplish with that. And like I said, it's worse today than it was then because more time has gone by and more babies have been killed. Right. So, Mark, in, in the little time we have left, tell uh, our people about how to connect with Life Dynamics. Uh, what are some of the things you do on a regular basis they might want to sign up for and uh, to get involved? Because like you said, we've got to get the individual person that says, you know, well, I'm pro-life or I think abortion's wrong from just not articulating that, but doing something about it. So how can they engage? re-engage and engage with Life Dynamics? Well, we're online, of course. We have a lot of websites, and one of the primary one is lifedynamics.com, so they can reach us through there, or they can call us here at the office in Denton, Texas. Um, and, of course, we put a ton of stuff on the Internet, and we have all kinds of things on the Internet. Um, and I want to encourage everybody, in, in, particularly in this day, with, with the Biden uh, team, have a abortion team taking over, um, the, the issue here that we need to get back to, and I said we need to get back to our roots, we need, we're need we not going to win this thing in Washington, D.C. or in any state capital until we win it in the local communities. And we've got a, several examples of that going on right now here in Texas, for example, with the Sanctuary City campaign. Um, but we've got to get back to the point where each individual pro-lifer in this country knows there's something they can do right in their community. They can't affect the Supreme Court. They can't affect Congress or the Senate or the presidency or whatever, but they can affect their local community. And we've seen good examples of that just recently right here in Texas. And uh, we're now working on a project, and I think we're going to be probably partnering with you guys on it, um, to show people what they can do in their community without spending a lot of money, because a lot of pro-lifers don't have a lot of money. Um, but they've got to know that they have a stake in this and there's something that they can do. And um, so I would encourage people to to contact us here at the office in Denton, Texas, uh, or uh, online at lifedynamics.com and get our newsletter so that we can keep you abreast of the things that are going on um, in this new project. We're calling it Operation Homefront. Um, so that they can get involved in their local community. And also, too, I want to remind people, Mark, and I bet you it's on your website, um, to donate 
to life dynamics because your your projects i mean are just amazing they have made so much uh progress over the years i know father frank and i have been good disciples of all your projects over the years we've done them uh we've uh you know spread them out there and so how can what's the best way to do, make a donation like today during this program to life dynamics uh, just write your name on the back of a hundred ten dollar bills and send them in <laughs> <laughs> no. uh, yeah, we yeah, we do survive off the donation and the generosity and the sacrificial giving of our donors, obviously, like any other pro-life organization has to. We don't have we don't get millions of dollars a day from the federal government like Planned Parenthood does. So we have to raise our own funds. And uh, things have been uh, dicey on that front here recently, as you well know. And so I would really encourage people, if you can afford whatever you can afford to send, it would be great. We'd be very much appreciated. Um, but it would right now it would go to funding this, the creation of this new project um, that we're really, really excited about. It's going to be I think it's going to be one of the best things we ever did as far as actually helping people bring an end to this. OK, so we're going to go to lifedynamics.com and you're going to hit that donate button. Absolutely. Uh, I, I tell Mark about the great audience we have on our streaming programming. Um, so let's let's really support this work. It's going to be a great grassroots project. Father Pavone and I will be involved with Mark and our good friends at Life Dynamics with it. And uh, finally, you know, <clears throat> Mark, I do have to do a little shout out to you and your beautiful family, your wife, uh, Tulane. And you guys just celebrated your 50th wedding anniversary, didn't you? Just last week. We were married yeah. 50 years. Wow. And, uh, you know, it's one of those deals you think, where did the time go? You know, it, it seems like yesterday, you know, that we were still, of course, we've known each other since we were kids. But, <laughs> uh, so so that means I can't tell her a bunch of stories about, how, you know, how, what a, what a uh, terrific guy I was before she met me because she was there. And so she, um, she didn't go for that, but yeah, we, we celebrated our 50th wedding anniversary, um, last Thursday. And, um, it's, you know, somebody asked me the other day, what's the key to, uh, this was a younger male asked me, so what's the key to being married for 50 years? And I, I've, it's the same answer I always give marry your trophy wife first. And that way you can stay married and, and create and, and save yourself a lot of grief and a lot of trouble over the years. Just marry your trophy wife first and settle in. That's right. Well, and if you have a call life dynamics, you might be fortunate to talk to Tulane. Sometimes she answers the phone. She and so again, does. Mark, I really want to thank you for joining me. It's always a great conversation. And brothers and sisters, please go to lifedynamics.com, sign up to get their newsletter. And please, any donation you can give will be greatly appreciated because Mark has more ideas that, out there, but he needs the money to get them out to you. So thank you again for joining me, Mark, and give my hello uh, to all my friends there in Denton, Texas. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Okay. God bless. Well, brothers and sisters, thank you for joining me again on Just Ask Janet. And just remember, there are some abortions only you can stop and some lives only you can save. Join me again next time. God bless.